In the late 1800s, there was a battle between different kinds of electricity, alternating and direct, that was called the War of the Current. Now a major motion picture starring my boyfriend, Benedict Cumberbatch. There are thousands of videos about this conflict, but this is the first, as far as I know, that covers the actual physics of why they were in conflict, as well as the crazy horse-killing history. Ready? Let's go! Electricity, 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 electricity. One day in the spring of 1885, a 38-year-old American named George Westinghouse read an article that changed his life. The article was about something called alternating current, or AC. Now, AC wasn't new. In fact, 54 years earlier, in 1831, Michael Faraday had found that moving a strong magnet into or out of a coil of wire will create or induce a current. He created the idea of magnetic fields and stated a law that if the magnetic field in the coil changes, current is induced. Faraday's paper inspired a Frenchman to spin magnets near coils of wire. In this machine, the coils would get current that would go back and forth or alternate. However, at the time, they thought the alternating current was useless and used brushes to force the alternating current into pulse direct current, or DC. 25 years later, in 1856, scientists removed brushes and successfully used AC to light lamps. What made this article in 1885 different and so interesting to Westinghouse was they added another machine to the AC generator, a transformer, which altered the voltage and the current after it had been created. To understand how a transformer works, I need to take a step back and describe voltage and current, which are not the same thing. Current is how much charge is moving in a wire over time. Think of water running through a faucet. Voltage is how much electromotive force there is behind it. Think of the water pressure in your faucet. A battery has the same constant voltage, whether it's in a circuit or on the shelf. While the current that the battery produces depends on the circuit it's connected to. With AC, you're making the voltage and current, not with a chemical reaction like a battery, but by changing the magnetic field in a coil. This changing field has a certain amount of power, which transformed into a certain amount of oscillating voltage and a certain amount of oscillating current. You can change the voltage, but if you increase the voltage, you have to correspondingly decrease the current and vice versa. A transformer is actually a deceptively simple device, just two separate coils that are wrapped around an iron ring or bar. Coils of wire with current in them act like a bar magnet, called an electromagnet. Alternating current in loops of wire therefore act like a magnet that is constantly changing direction. An alternating current in the first coil creates an alternating magnetic field in the first coil, which creates an alternating current in the second coil. If the second coil has more loops, you get more voltage and less current. If the second coil has less loops, then you get less voltage and more current. That's it. With transformers, you can build your power plant far away and then transform the electricity to high voltage and low current so that a lot less power will be lost to heat as it goes down the line. Then near your houses, you can transform it to lower voltage and high current and use it as you wish. And luckily for Westinghouse, Edison's new light bulb worked just as well for direct current as it did for alternating current. Still, most people did not want to use alternating current. Why not? Well, for several reasons. One, there was no alternating current motor at the time. Two, alternating current with those high voltages was very dangerous. And three, Alternating current could not be used with the most advanced generators at the time. See, in 1866, at least three people, including a German named Siemens of the Siemens company, discovered generators that use self-excitations, or using electromagnets and rerouting some of the electricity produced by the generator to charge up the electromagnet. Before one-way valves or diodes, they couldn't use self-excitation with AC. So most engineers felt that AC was a step backwards, not a step forward. Despite this, Westinghouse had a vision that AC was the future. He sent a message to a young engineer named Guido Pantaleone, who was in Italy for his father's funeral, to get the patent rights 
to the Transformer Sight Unseen, which he did. Pantaleone also got some Siemens generators, even though Siemens himself assured him that, quote, there's nothing whatever in alternating current. It was pure humbug, and his self-excitation system had rendered alternating current useless. In fact, almost all of Westinghouse's employees thought it was a bad idea, and it was only his personal will that put it through. By January of 1886, Westinghouse created the Westinghouse Electric Company with stock worth $1 million. Meanwhile, a Westinghouse employee named William Stanley tried a secret run of the AC system in his hometown of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Three months later, they're almost ready to light up a local department store when the Edison people beat them to it and lit up a local mansion. Undeterred, a week later, Stanley electrified a store from a barn about a mile away. They kept the details of their device secret, even as far as hiding their transformers in basements, but let it be known that they could electrify any building in town. Soon Westinghouse's people had four to five times more business than the Edison people did. Westinghouse was ecstatic, Edison was not. Edison's people begged him to move to AC, but he refused. He felt that the dangers of AC would turn people off electricity altogether. He wrote his friend a private note. Just as certain as death, Westinghouse will kill a customer within six months. The next year, Edison published an 84-page warning saying, it is a matter of fact that any system employing high pressure, i.e. 500 to 2,000 volts, jeopardizes life. He railed that the Westinghouse system was cheap but deadly, and that they, quote, ought to unite in a war of extermination against cheapness that involves inefficiency and danger. This was not a misplaced fear. High-powered electricity was a new toy and companies were putting electrical wires willy-nilly with no interest in public safety. New York in particular was blanketed in wires from telegraph, telephone, and lighting companies, although Edison insisted on bearing his wires underground. In 1888, after a terrible snowstorm damaged many of the wires, there was a series of deaths attributed to high-voltage wires that was widely published in the newspaper. On June 5, 1888, a man named Harold Brown published an article about the constant danger from sudden death from the, quote, damnable, fatal alternating current. Brown was then given space in one of Edison's laboratories and started conducting gruesome experiments electrocuting dogs with alternating current. The next month, Brown gave his first demonstration to scientists and reporters which caused most people to walk out, quote, unable to endure the revolting exhibition. For the next two years, Brown repeated these horrible demonstrations on dogs and even horses, but not an elephant. That was not by Brown and was unrelated to the war of the currents. But his biggest coup was in the electric chair with AC current, of course. On August 6th, 1890, a murderer named William Kemmler was the first man sentenced to death by electrocution in an action that Edison wanted to call Westinghoused. Suffice it to say, the electrocution did not go well. The only silver lining to his disturbing demise was that it ruined Brown's reputation and he quietly slinked away from public life and Edison distanced himself from Brown and pretended to have never have heard of him. Meanwhile, a quirky but brilliant former employee of Edison's named Nikola Tesla had invented a new type of AC and a corresponding AC motor. What was different about Tesla's design was actually multiple AC systems in one. Recall that when a coil of wire passes by an electromagnet, it gets current that goes back and forth, AC. Tesla's idea was to use multiple coils of wire so that the coils would get the same current at the same frequency but at different peak times. This is called polyphase current. If that current is put into an artfully designed motor, the changing currents will continuously push the coils with a magnet and make it spin at a constant speed. Tesla determined that his motor worked the best at 60 cycles per second, or 60 hertz. In 1888, while Brown was killing dogs, Westinghouse paid Tesla and his company 
$70,000 in cash and note, plus $2.50 per horsepower on every Tesla motor from then on. Three years later, there was a stock market crash and Westinghouse was in deep trouble. He went to Tesla and pleaded for release from the payments on his motors, saying, quote, your decision determines the fate of the Westinghouse company. Tesla then tore up his contract. Westinghouse still wasn't out of trouble. He was being sued for patent infringement by Edison for $1 billion. That's billion with a B in the late 1800s. This brings us to JP Morgan. Morgan, like everyone else involved in electricity, had been watching the success of AC systems, which Edison stubbornly refused to use or accept. He orchestrated a coup, merging Edison's company with another, firing Edison from his own company, and even removing Edison's name from his own company. From that time on, instead of Edison's General Electric, it was plain General Electric, or GE. Edison pretended he had moved on, saying, quote, I can't waste my time over electric lighting matters, for they are old. But truthfully, he was heartbroken. Edison's secretary said that, quote, I know something had died in Edison's heart. He had a deep-seated, enduring pride in his name, and that name had been violated, torn from the title of the great industry created by his genius through years of intense planning and unremitting toil. From then on, even GE used alternating current. The war of the currents was over. Two years later, there was a Columbian exhibition in Chicago, and it was enormous, covering 600 acres with over 200 new buildings and a total of 27 million visitors. And Westinghouse lit it with AC light at Tesla's 60 Hertz. At the fair, Tesla gave demonstrations to the adoring crowds of something brand new, wireless electricity, which was to make him a superstar, at least for a while. However, in order to talk about Tesla and wireless, I first have to take a step back and talk about the connection between light and electricity and how that led to radio and wireless. And that all started when a college student asked Michael Faraday in 1845 if he could turn light with a magnet. How Michael Faraday dreamed that light was an electromagnetic wave is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and forget to do anything if you don't like it. Also, if you're confused about how a generator works, I have a video about that. If you want to know more about how Edison got so powerful in the first place, I have a video about that. And make sure to check out the video I'm working on right now about uh, Michael Faraday and the electromagnetic wave. It's going to be a good one. Okay, have a good day.